All right, so um, why don't we go ahead and start? Um, I'm I, I'm glad to see um, this this great group of folks here to talk about patents and the public interest. Um, this is a speaker series that is being run by the Program on Information and Justice and Intellectual Property at American University Washington College of Law. Uh, my name is Charles Duan. I am a senior fellow with PIGIP um, and also a, 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 a and also a postdoc at Cornell, as well as a senior fellow at the R Street Institute of Think Tank um, in DC. And I've been working in this um, space of patents and the public interest for many years. Um, I think it's a fascinating space, and you know I've met lots and lots of interesting people. And my hope is to share with um, folks in the community, um, in academics, and particularly with students potentially interested in careers in this unique space, um, an opportunity to interact with some of the folks who have been thought leaders and experts and um, you know, been very important in this field. And so I'm pleased to be joined today um, with, uh, by, by Abby Rives, um, who is IP counsel at Engine. Um, Abby is a good friend of mine and uh, works on startup advocacy at Engine. Um, she is a graduate of Emory Law School and previously has worked at um, has worked as a patent attorney. Um, has worked at NIH. She was a clerk to um, to Judge Clevenger on the Federal Circuit. So you know, I think we'll have a fascinating discussion of a really interesting career path. Um, so so welcome, Abby. Um, pleased to pleased to have you here. Thanks, Charles. Uh, thanks to American, the Washington College Law, and Pidgip for putting on this series. And thanks to Charles for inviting us to be a part of it. I think this is such an important but underappreciated issue in the patent policy space. So we're really grateful to be part of the conversation. Yeah, so very glad to have you here. Uh, so Abby, why don't you start off by just telling us a little bit about your organization and your work there. So um, Engine, as I understand it, um, focuses on startup adv advocacy. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of the general scope of your work and um, as it relates particularly to patents, but generally in terms of what Engine is focusing on? Definitely. So yes, we are a pretty small nonprofit and we are focused on policy analysis, research and advocacy to promote the su success of high tech, high growth startups across the country. We work with a network of over a thousand innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, incubators, accelerators, other folks who are in the ecosystem uh, supporting startups. And we work together to uh, support the work of these uh, exciting companies in every corner of the country. Again, we're a small team, but we work on a, a range of tech policy issues, kind of as much as we can cover at once. Um, there's some really obvious areas that we focus on beyond intellectual property, like access to capital, things like tax incentives or uh, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which I think is uh, up for a vote to be reauthorized today. Uh, we spend a lot of our energy thinking about talent pipelines, things like immigration policy and STEM education. We also look at issues like privacy and security, telecom, broadband access, things that are really important to both innovators and consumers in the high tech space. Um, we have a portfolio focused on how can we make our innovation ecosystems more diverse and more equitable. So our work cuts across a range of issues. And when it comes to intellectual property, uh, I handle or lead the organization's patent and copyright policy work. And I'll focus on our patent work, obviously, for the purpose of today's discussion. And when we come to our work in patent policy, we're focused on themes of quality and balance. And so I think uh, of this is largely falling into two buckets when we think about the way startups perhaps most commonly experience the patent system. On the one hand, startups, not all of them, but definitely some of them, some fraction of them are going to want to uh, develop a patent portfolio as part of their work. Patents can help signal things to the market, attract investors, send a message to your consumers about the quality of the product or the service that you're putting out there. Um, it can facilitate partnerships, joint ventures, um, establish a differentiation uh, against your competitors. And so high quality patents can be a valuable asset as startups are trying to do all of those things. 
But on the other hand, startups, like many small businesses in the country, also know the problems that other people's invalid patents can cause. Invalid patents, when they are issued, can stand in the way of innovation, competition, and uh, productive economic activity for all kinds of small businesses, including tech-enabled startups. And small businesses and startups are uniquely vulnerable sometimes in the face of invalid patents. And so we spend a lot of our time thinking about how can the federal government do better to deliver on high quality patents that support innovation without having the problems of low quality and imbalances in the system stand in the way of uh, emerging technology. So that's fantastic. And, you know, I, I really appreciate um, the way that you're thinking about sort of the connection between these startups and, and patent quality. And I know that you did this really great event um, recently, uh, Patent Quality Week. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what um, the, the work that you did mm -hmm. and how that event worked? Yeah. So we have uh, just over two years ago, Engine launched Patent Quality week. And I'll dig into a little bit more of why it is and what it is, but just like very logistically, practically speaking, it's a series of events that started during COVID. So, so far it's been predominantly virtual events, uh, written work and social media engagement around the importance of patent quality in many ecosystems and sectors of the U.S. economy. And our goal with Patent Quality Week was to highlight the very big tent of stakeholders that depend on a US patent system focused on quality and balance. And um, I can talk a little bit more in a moment about the different ways and specifics that different companies can experience the patent system. But in doing the work I do at Engine, I very quickly realized how many other companies, individuals, and uh, sectors of different industries experience the patent system in common ways. And that drives us towards sharing common goals and principles that we think should drive sound patent policy. So startups and small businesses, I've already mentioned, um, think about patent quality and balance, but they're not alone. We know that patient advocates are making some of the same points that we're making, that domestic manufacturers, big tech companies, generic pharmaceutical companies, digital rights advocates, civil society and public interest organizations, some right-wing think tanks, some left-wing think tanks, financial services uh, sector from the biggest banks in the country to small community banks, Main Street businesses, realtors, restaurants, I could go on. All of these folks have some common ways in which they think about and experience the patent system and therefore have some common goals for what we think patent policy should look like. And so we at Engine uh, play a convening role in putting together Patent Quality Week, but our goal is really to highlight those common interests and uh, shine a bright light on really how much of the U.S. economy agrees with us on what sound patent policy looks like. Yeah, so that's fantastic. And, you know, I think that one of the things that I learned when I first came into um, into the policy space is just how important coalition building is, you know, getting all of these different interest groups together um, who you know, come from different places, but end up having common goals. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really fantastic that you've had the opportunity to, um, that, that you've had the opportunity to do that. Um, what are some of the, the, the policy changes that you think would be really important, um, particularly in terms of patent quality, but more generally for startups? Like, what are the issues that you're looking at? So if I could take just a step back on, on the importance of coalition, I think it segues into your question also, um, when we're thinking about patent quality week and the, the, the common interest that tech startups and uh, mom and pop pizza restaurants and dry cleaners and uh, big banks have in common. Uh, I think it's interesting in these big common themes, like we want quality, we want balance, we don't want abusive litigation, we want good patents, we don't want bad patents, we can, we can have all of these common thematic higher level points. But then when you get down into some of the nitty gritty details, we also have a lot of agreement. Like, uh, I think we would all agree that Fintiv Factor 2 is wrong, and we could agree on what we think the solution would be, like, let's strike Fintiv Factor 2. And so it's not just some of the big picture stuff that we share in common, I think, and I'm not going to waste everybody's time. To, uh, unwrapping what fintive means, but it's a, it, hopefully you 
even if you don't know what that means off the top of your head, you can appreciate it. It's like a very kind of small surgical policy issue that uh, huge swaths of the economy agree about. And so I think uh, a decent amount of this past patent quality week did involve people talking about uh, the fintive factors and latching onto fintive factor too. And so um, the importance of building coalitions is really valuable and I think so educational and illuminating how much it is that we really do agree upon. Um, and then, Charles, to answer the question that you asked about some of the policy issues that were focused on. Um, so uh, I mentioned uh, or started to allude to some of the ways in which startups can experience the patent system, not as patent owners, but as people who encounter other patents, uh, patents owned by others. And um, there's a probably familiar to to everyone on this call, the, the story of the patent assertion entity, that's an entity that can obtain oftentimes low quality patents that are weak, overbroad, claim things that are already known. But once they have those patents, they can use them to sue or threaten to sue uh, anybody. And the cost of litigation are very high. Startups are uniquely vulnerable, operating under resource constraints that make them um, particularly susceptible to this type of coercion. And so they'll pay to make these threats go away, or they'll uh, have to spend a lot of money, a lot of time in litigation to, to avoid what is a meritless and frivolous accusation at the end of the day. Um, we see similar tactics adopted, um, not by uh, non-practicing entities, but by operating companies. So there can be an established company and a market and a startup or a group of startups want to enter and compete for some of that market space. And the established company with a large patent portfolio sometimes can engage in similar sorts of tactics to use the fact of litigation to frustrate the ability of nascent companies to launch and succeed. And sometimes that's called patent, patent predation or patent bullying. Um, and then third, uh, a third way in which other people's invalid patents can hurt innovation is just that the space that the invalid patent improperly covers can dissuade people from doing any sort of innovation that might run afoul of those invalid claims. And so it can, before we even get to the point of any patent assertion, um, create problems for the ability of innovators to innovate. And so when you think about those three stories, there are some common elements that are apparent. One is the problem of invalid patents. They do occasionally get issued by the patent office and indeed studies estimate that as many as 30% of patents issued by the PTO would be obvious or anticipated if they were tested in court. So the numbers can get pretty high. And so one area of policy that we spend a lot of time thinking about is just how can we help the PTO deliver on its mission better. And um, some of that goes to resource allocation, how much time do examiners get to review applications. Right now, it averages around 20 hours per application, which isn't a lot of time, especially when you consider that some of the patents I worked on when I was a litigator are 80 pages long. Um, there can be an enormous amount of prior art that you're going to have to dive into, and 20 hours just isn't enough in some of the really complicated and cutting edge technology that uh, people are developing today. So. One thing is just resource allocation, going to the PTO, giving the examiners what they need to do their job. That's not just time, it's not just money, but sometimes it's resources. How can we be smarter about searching prior art, leveraging artificial intelligence to get the best references in front of the examiner just to make their job easier? Um, so that's one example of policy that we're talking about. Another area where there's an awful lot of focus right now, in DC at least, is around what happens after the invalid patents issue, when they're getting asserted, and are there efficient, affordable ways to clear out those invalid patents without forcing startups, small businesses, manufacturers, et cetera, to spend a lot of time and a lot of money in litigation? Can we reduce the economic burden of these assertions? And some of the policy levers that Congress put into place include uh, inter partes review, where instead of having to go back to court to challenge the invalid claims, you can go to a board within the patent office and basically ask the agency to take a second look at claims. And so if you make a strong showing to the patent trial and appeal board that you think a claim is likely invalid, they'll take a second look and cancel claims that shouldn't have issued in the first place. Um, it's much cheaper by an order of magnitude than going to litigation, but it's very controversial 
And so uh, I think we spend a lot of our time in these patent policy conversations today, just continuing to talk about the value of things like inter partes review that reduce the, the cost of clearing out invalid claims. Another area of law, which is pretty high profile right now, at least in patent policy circles, has to do with subject matter eligibility. This is like the Alice case, section 101 of the Patent Act. And this is an area, um, for those of you who don't know, the law says you can't patent an abstract idea, a law of nature, uh, a natural phenomenon. It's the area of law that says you can't get a patent and own a human gene. It's also the area of law that says you can't get a patent on generic software or computer processors that collect data, analyze it, and display results. And um, there was a period of time when you could get those patents where there's a little gap in the case law that allowed a lot of these abstract idea patents to slip through. And then in 2014, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't patent abstract ideas. You can't patent generic functional implementation of abstract ideas. And um, the Supreme Court also confirmed that you can mount this eligibility defense very early in litigation. And this has been exceedingly valuable to startups because if somebody got a patent on, let's say for example, um, uh, collecting and organizing digital images, just like bringing in digital images to some sort of network system, figuring out which images need to go where and sending them. Just that general of a concept. Lots and lots of companies do that. Um, and I know a startup founder in Nebraska who uh, has an app that facilitates the work that contractors do. And contractors take a lot of photos. If any of you had work done on your house, they take a lot of photos, they send them around to different parts of their team, figuring out what supplies they need, figuring out which expert needs to come in and tweak which little knob next. Um, and so this uh, startup was sued for infringement because they were transmitting digital images and they use section 101 as a defense to get the, the patent litigation to go away. And so that was really uh, affordable relatively speaking, it was still like $80,000, but affordable, relatively speaking, um, for the company, and they were able to get out from underneath this accusation. Um, so that's how eligibility works. And it is, again, very controversial. And there's a lot of disagreement, uh, I think, on the Hill um, right now about what the law should be there and how it should work in a way that is clear and consistent and predictable, which is super important in any area of the law, especially from the small business perspective. But we want to make sure that we have a law that substantively works well while also being clear, consistent, and predictable. So that's just a few examples. Yeah, so lots and lots of really interesting issues. And like, I, I, I love the stories that you're telling about like this, uh, about this woman at a startup um, and about, you know, some of these patent assertion entities. Um, and, you know, that, that plays in with something I wanted to, to talk with you about, which is, you know, a lot of times what you're doing is you're just educating lawmakers, you're trying to talk with these startups. Um, and these folks, you know, they, they aren't going to know like the terminology or the complexities of patent law. So, you know, what are your strategies for bringing that, you know, often very detailed and technical legal information to some of these folks who aren't as familiar uh, with these with these doctrines so i think of the work that we do at engine is largely falling into three buckets and uh, one of those is communicating with startups and you're exactly right um, especially at many of the startups that we work with they're not big enough or wealthy enough to have in-house counsel yet so we're not even talking to attorneys who might be general uh, attorneys, we're talking to startup founders, we're talking to engineers, we're talking to business people. Um, so they don't know patent eligibility. So we spend a lot of our time on educating and talking to startups. And that includes writing and events to help educate folks about what's happening in the Hill and what some of these concepts look like and why it's important to get involved in policy conversations. It's also a lot of listening, though, because when startups tell you their stories, they tell you their pain points, they tell you what their unpleasant experiences are. Somebody, a, a founder, uh, of a med tech startup came to me and was talking or you know we were having a conversation he's in our network uh, we were talking about his experience with an abusive patent assertion entity and he describes the patent and it's like it was just about anonymizing data they didn't know what we did they just knew we anonymized data so they said well you must infringe our patent because we own anonymizing data from that story you know i can understand what some of the patent policy issues were uh where some of the policy issues percolate up in his story. So by listening to the stories and the examples, it can help us learn. Um, and then uh, the second bucket of the work that we do, I think is educating policymakers, Hill staff, uh, Department of Commerce employees, patent office employees. And um, 
there is a varying range of expertise on patent law there. Of course, patent office officials are extraordinarily uh, steeped in these issues. They get all of the, the legal uh, and substantive and technical concepts of patent law. So in many instances for them, I, hopefully it's just sharing the stories and making sure that they can hear these startup voices. But then when you're talking to some Hill staff, these are people who are incredibly smart, very sophisticated thinkers, but they are responsible for covering everything that is going on in, con in Congress and being enough of an expert to help inform their boss on the entire Judiciary Committee's portfolio. So they have a lot of work, they're very busy, and so and they're not patent lawyers by training in many cases. And so I find that telling them stories is also a very effective and important tool. But the third thing, which um, is the third bucket of the work that we do at Engine is um, some of our analytical and intellectual and empirical research work. And so we do research, we run surveys, and um, we, we build on the research that other folks have done, pulling numbers from databases and putting it in charts that are easily visualized and putting out reports that explain, um, we've done a lot of research around how much money is being invested in US startups. And so when we collect that sort of information and that sort of data and deliver that to Hill staff, I also find that that can be very, very important because we do want evidence-based policymaking, anecdotes, aren't enough and shouldn't be enough to convince Congress to move a, a big piece of legislation. So the stories can help educate and help people understand what's going on and why it's important. But I think that uh, at Engine, we try to develop that data and do the analytical and empirical work to put behind why we need a policy change. So um, we, we think about our conversations with startups, our conversations in education with policymaking staff and our empirical work. Hopefully those three points can help um, uh, combined together to, to deliver a good package to everybody. Yeah, that's so. So that's really, really interesting. And you know, I really like um, all of the different folks that you talk to, and all the sort of different ways that you you talk to folks. Um, like your point about the um, about talking with the, the folks at the patent office and telling them these stories about um, start about the startups that that you hear from them. Um, just as a brief note, I sit on an advisory account, council of the patent office, and so nothing I'm saying it represents the views of the patent office or all of my own views. Um, but I think actually this is a great transition to talking about uh, to talk about your career path uh, because. It sounds like you know you're doing all sorts of fascinating work, and you know I'm sure that a lot of a lot of the the folks um, would like to hear how you how you become how, how you become a person like that, how you get to do these sorts of really exciting things, um, particularly some of the um, some of the students who are who are um, who are at this presentation. Um, number one, so if there are any folks who would like to ask questions, um, please feel free to use the the raise hands feature in Zoom and. Um, I'll try to call on you. I'd like to prioritize student questions to the extent that that's possible. Um, so and, and so, you know, we'll we'll try we'll try to do that. Um, but but Abby, can you start off by just telling us, you know, how did you get this fantastic job? What was what was your what was your career um, path that that led you here? So, I can start from the most recent transition that I made in my career, which explains how I got to Engine. Um, right before I joined Engine, I was a litigation associate at a big law firm here in DC. You focused on predominantly patent litigation in district court, but also trade secrets and uh, some other uh, smaller projects. And um, I had really, a wonderful experience at the firm, really brilliant, great colleagues, wonderful clients. One of the biggest cases that I worked on was representing a small med tech startup that found itself in one of these situations where an established competitor in the industry was using litigation to try and slow down many of its emerging competitors. And so I had like what felt like a very personal um, tangible exposure to some of the problems that startups face when the patent system isn't working quite right. Um, I also, though, got really phenomenal training uh, and really honed my skills. I was very fortunate to work at a firm that trusted me with a lot of autonomy and authority in some of the cases that I worked on. I was supervising parts of cases, working very closely with experts, taking depositions, drafting substantive motions. And so I was getting a lot of really good experience early in my career. So for students out there thinking about um, 
jobs that you would like to take and that you would like to pursue, I encourage you to be thinking about going to places where they will give you a lot of responsibility early in your career, because that's invaluable in terms of growing your skill sets and also finding communities. Like I was lucky enough to find where you're gonna have great mentors and people that want to see you succeed and support you in doing that work. So giving you the autonomy, but also giving you uh, the support that you need to succeed. So he was in that environment and it was great. Um, and a friend of mine who was on the job market saw a job posting at Engine for IP counsel and she just forwarded it along because she thought, oh, this seems kind of interesting. You should know about it. And when I saw it, I thought, yeah, that is kind of interesting. It's a very unique position. I've never heard of anything like this. Uh, I think I would like to meet these folks and figure out what they're all about. And so I sent my resume off. I came in and met with the team at Engine. And um, for a number of reasons, it felt like a really good fit and a really good place for me to be. Again, as I mentioned, I'd spent a lot of time at the firm working on patent litigation defense for a startup, which is very relevant to so much of Engine's work. Um, but I started out my career working for the government at NIH. And I think I always saw myself um, in a more public facing uh, or public interest facing uh, career path and thinking about policy issues. And so um, after I spoke to the folks at Engine, I thought this was a way to, to dip my toe back into the water and see if this sort of work was something I wanted to pursue again. Yeah. It was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been there for for several years now, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so hopefully it, it it seems to have worked out. Um, no, but I think I think that that's um, that's really fantastic. And yeah, so you know one of the things that 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 certainly is true is that you know Engine is a smaller organization. Um, you know, kind of coming across the, um, the, the, the opportunities as they come up is, is not as easy compared to, you know, some of the big firms who can participate in like big career fairs and such. Um, what would be your advice for somebody who's interested in going into this field um, in terms of, you know, finding, finding a career in this space? Um, so my first piece of career advice for basically everyone, but it certainly applies in response to your question, is um, I think it's always good to be thinking about what you wanna do, what you wanna achieve, have some vision for your career, some goals, visualize like, here's where I see myself in five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, whatever works for you to think about advancing your career in those ways. But don't be so rigid and so inflexible that when an opportunity comes across your plate, you don't notice it. So make sure that you are keeping your mind open enough so that when there are these unique opportunities that come up, that you're willing to take a branch in your career path. Um, I know that uh, it's, it's a luxury to be able to take some of the risks that I have been able to take in my career. And I, I hope that in the future, you know, everybody can be afforded that same opportunity to take some risks. I know it's not a reality now. Um, I took a big pay cut when I came to do the job that I'm doing now. But I think just keeping your eyes open, at least, um, and your ears to the ground and building your network and having you know, being a good colleague, being a good friend, showing integrity in your work, uh, these opportunities will um, may just present themselves to you. So mm -hmm. keep your mind open, um, but more specifically on trying to get um, jobs like the one that I have. I think that there are um, a handful of things to be doing. One is look out for internship opportunities. We at Engine, uh, host at least one intern basically all the time. It's usually one fall semester, one spring semester, and one summer intern, but sometimes more depending on um, what opportunities are available and who's interested. And I think a lot of the organizations that we work with like to similarly find opportunities to have interns come on board um, either full-time or part-time to provide support. And so that's a really great way to get exposure to the work and to gain some of those uh, practical experiences and to start to build the network and the relationships that I think you always need if you're going to, to be going in any direction in your career. Um, I would also suggest to people that, especially if you're coming just out of school, that um, you think about what skills you need to build or hone to make yourself a really, um, to make yourself a, a I don't want to say really excellent, but for lack of a better word that I can find right now, really excellent um, advocate for whatever it is that you want to do. And I think, um, 
sometimes I describe my career as a series of happy accidents. And through my work at the firm, through my work in the government before I went to law school, and especially I think through my work um, as a clerk at the federal circuit, I had a lot of opportunities to really hone my writing, which was something that um, didn't come naturally to me. It's not something that I, I think I was good at historically. It still takes me a lot of practice and a lot of time to write um, in a way that is um, hopefully compelling <laughs> and concise. And so so um, I think that in these public sector jobs, it might be hard for you to grow some of those skills. And so uh, I think thinking about other ways and other opportunities, be they jobs that you take before you try and make the jump into a public interest organization like I did, or um, other like extracurricular things like writing trainings and writing groups that you can join if writing is a, a pain point for you like it is for me. Um, be on the lookout for making sure that you can find what you need to grow your skills. And sometimes that's going to be taking a job that maybe doesn't align with your um, immediate career interest, but I think will advance your overall career goals, or finding more creative ways to go about getting that training is something that I would recommend folks think about. Um, uh, I think if you're interested in in anything even adjacent to litigation, um, I would strongly recommend considering clerking for some judge somewhere in the country. That was an extraordinarily valuable experience. And I met so many wonderful people clerking. My co-clerk, the co-clerks, I mean, the clerks for the other judges on the court um, are extraordinarily smart people who do all range of things. I have one friend who uh, I clerked at the same time as me who has a very similar job working uh, with the pharmaceutical industry and um, other people who are partners at their law firms who are working in-house counsel at uh, different companies, um, but also hung out their own shingle. Um, people are doing really, really interesting work. Those are important and valuable connections to have um, and can eventually help if you want to be in a law firm. Uh, build your book of business. But if you want to be in a job like we have at Engine, I think that having those networks is really, really valuable. Um, so those are some ideas. I'll let you know if others come to me. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that that's uh, that that that's that that's really great and really helpful, and you know, particularly just the value of having all of those connections. I know that I found um I, I found my way into the space just based on um you know friends of friends and having enough conversations with folks. Um, and so you know, I think that one of the things I really appreciate is just how open this community is. You know, I've um had opportunities to just talk with so many folks and learn about what the space looks like, and that's really what kind of got me um to to where I am and. You know, I think um, you can tell very similar stories, Abby. Um, Bob has a, so Professor Cook Deegan has a question in the chat. Um, he, he asked about the pay cut that you took um, for your current position, asked um, what you thought about that, particularly um, it seems like it meant that the work that you were doing at Engine felt more meaningful to you possibly. Yes, so um, starting from the minutia first again um i uh, was fortunate to and i think i, I don't I, I describe my career as a series of happy accidents i think it's also important to like work hard and to to, to always be showing that you're a good colleague and a good team member and work hard and try and grow yourself and be as excellent as you can be because when opportunities come across your plate uh, you want the hiring manager to want to hire you you don't just want to be attentive to the opportunity so that's very important and i think uh, also uh, as part of how i was able to get some financial support uh, when i went back to law school i, I left uh, a career and decided to go back to school and take on a lot of debt but i was able to get some scholarships and loans on pretty good terms. And um, then working at the law firm, I was able to pay off all of my student loan debt, um, which really freed me up. So that was something that was always top of mind and really freed me to, to have more flexibility in my career once those loans were off my plate. Um, but in terms of the bigger picture of the question, um, definitely I, um, at the beginning of my career, if you had said, are you going to go work at a law firm? Uh, when I left NIH and went to law school, I'd say, no, 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 I'm going to come back to NIH. This is what I want to do. This is where I'm, where I'm supposed to be. Um, and then a lot of opportunities came available and I chose to chase those. And it was the right decision for me at each point in time. But I think um, I have always thought uh, that my career would find me in a more uh, public oriented role. And I think that at the law firm, I loved that I was able to make a difference for people's business. Uh, when we won a case, uh, when we got a good outcome for a client, you could really 
practically feel like, oh, this is really good uh, for my client. Uh, but I do think that the ability to have a broader impact in doing policy work, working for the government or working in an organization where I work now, hopefully we'll be able to have more impact and make it so that more people get those wins and so that, that we have more good outcomes, we have more innovation, we have more competition, we have more opportunities, we have more great jobs in this country, um, we're a fairer, we're more equitable society. And so um, I am excited about being able to work towards those sorts of goals. That said, it comes with very different challenges. Um, it's harder to know what a win looks like. I still know what a, what a loss looks like here in my job at Engine, but um, I think the wins feel further apart and less obvious. And so it is a struggle to see the meaning in the work. And so one thing I find myself doing periodically when I can feel like, oh, this is a lot. Is it even worth it? Should I even show up? I think, what would this conversation look like if I weren't in the room? What would this docket, this rulemaking docket look like if I weren't filing comments? What would the what would the perspective be of this policymaker if I weren't bringing these startup tables to the convert startup stories to the table, making sure that they were aware of what their constituents are experiencing across the board? And that helps me feel like, yeah, there's still a lot of value here. And um, even if it can feel like we're pushing a a large boulder up a hill constantly, um, it does feel like really meaningful work. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that you mentioned that. I've, I've had that same feeling many times where, you know, I'm filing something and I, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's gonna read my comments, but then I also think, you know, if if it weren't for me, there would be nobody who would, who would be saying that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just a really interesting experience. Yeah, when I, uh... I don't want to dwell on this too much. I want to be respectful of your your, your <laughs> note about the PPAC um, and your role on the PPAC and that you are not speaking for the agency. But um, I think that on patent policy stuff, uh, it's, it's really difficult for the patent office to talk to most folks. Uh, they talk to patent owners. They talk to patent applicants. The system is set up that way. And then uh, they can receive petitions when they've uh, when there's an invalid claim out there that somebody wants to challenge. But there are very few channels of communication for this really important agency to hear from everybody else. They don't have to talk to the startup who was wrongfully accused of infringement. That happens often at court. And so having these, finding these channels to have the conversations and make sure that the patent office gets all the information that it needs to do its job well is hard work. And of course, I think the government, it's incumbent upon the government to try and listen to all of its stakeholders, all of its, its constituents. But I, I think it's also really important that there be people out there like you, Charles, uh, to be willing to provide um, that input into our policymakers because they wanted to, I mean, these are really, I don't know, maybe not across the board, but pretty much universally, I think the people who work for the government want to do the right thing and want to deliver good outcomes. And um, they just sometimes need help seeing what all is at stake. Yeah. And, you know, so I know that Bob has a question, but I actually want to just follow up quickly on that. Um, what sort of voices do you think are needed in the patent policy conversations? Um, you know, what sorts of perspectives? Um, what, you know, what sorts of um, lawyers with um, diverse backgrounds do you think really should be participating in these in these conversations? Yeah. So obviously, I think that startups uh, deserve a seat at the table and startups who don't want to experience the patent system, but are unwillingly dragged in um, when they are sued for infringement, or let's say you're an open source innovator and you want to do your, your innovation in an open source fashion, and then somebody comes along after you and files a patent on your work. That can be very in inconvenient for your ability to do your, your own innovation, and it gets in the way of open source communities. So there are all these ways in which people can unwillingly be dragged into the patent system. And I think that it's really important for those folks to get a voice at the table, because they didn't show up here voluntarily voluntarily. They might not know who to talk to, but their voice still matters. Um, another area, which I, I know, Charles, uh, you know more about this, and I know the panel, I mean, this, the speaker series will explore this later, but it's uh, end users of technology. Um, you know, here's my smartphone. I don't even know how many patents are involved in this, um, but I know that if, if uh, the patent system isn't working right, this is just going to keep getting more and more and more expensive, even though it's not getting so much better. It's just lots of little teeny tiny trivial patents start to add up and can make things really complicated uh, for the cost of my cell phone. Um, perhaps this is most obvious when you're thinking about patients who are uh, trying to, to afford very expensive medicines. Some of them are like the newest, most cutting edge medicines, but also we know that a lot of uh, 
therapeutic products that have been out there on the market for a while are still very expensive and there isn't the competition we might like to see in the market and patents can play a role there. So these are some of the voices that I hear from a lot in the work that I do, even though it's not directly relevant to my work. Again, going back to patent quality week, it's similar enough. And those are voices that I think deserve a seat at the table in patent policy conversations. And then just one third example, sorry to ramble, but um, uh, we know that um, our innovation ecosystems are not uh, diverse enough, it's not inclusive enough. Uh, and we also know that the patent system as a, as a, a subcomponent of our innovation ecosystem is not sufficiently diverse, equitable or inclusive. And if we are just talking to the same patent owners and patent attorneys, always we're never going to get to hear from those voices of innovators who've been left out of the patent system to understand what are the challenges that they face if they wanna participate in the patent system. Uh, if we're just talking to people who are already in the system system, we're missing out on that perspective. And so those are three, at least three uh, groups of folks that I think we need to be trying to figure out how to listen to better. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, you know, I think that um, sort of diversity in the innovation ecosystem is is just so important, and a lot of people are talking about it today. Um, I, I I love that you brought up the the sort of consumer and patient perspectives, um, which are also very important perspectives to to have in patent conversations. And you know, some of the the speakers we'll have further down in the series, um, I think we'll we'll um, work in that those spaces, and we'll definitely um, have some interesting conversations about that. Um, so so Professor Cook Deegan has a second question. Question. Um, he's asking about the um, the Emory Tech Transfer Office, um, and I think generally, you know, you, you've had some experience with Tech Transfer at NIH, um, and I think he's interested in sort of the the alignment between their positions and the public interest, and particularly um, the alignment between the views of like technical faculty scientists and such, um, compared with the licensing offices. So, like, if if you have thoughts on that, I think you know that's a really really interesting topic these days. It definitely is a really interesting topic, and I'll uh, start off with an apology that I'm not sure I'll be able to, I don't know that my experience yet has given me uh, the, the information that I would need to respond to all of this question. But one thing that I think is very interesting about technology transfer in the uh, university space is it's my understanding, this is still the case, that most university tech transfer offices are into economic value add. I think most of them uh, lose money. Emory is one of the universities, uh, I don't know how many there are, but uh, has had, I would say, like wildly successful uh, technology transfer operations. Some of the early AIDS drugs were discovered at Emory, and um, I'm going to forget the name of the drug now, but uh, there was another really high profile, very valuable drug that came out of Emory, and uh, so it moved through the technology transfer office into the into the commercial sector. So um, I think having worked at Emory's tech transfer office gives me a little bit, and I, I, I uh, not that everybody knows my resume, it was an intern for one semester while I was in law school with Emory's technology transfer office. Um, so I guess I have maybe a little bit of a different perspective on technology transfer because I had that insight into what it looks like when it's working extraordinarily well and um, adding a lot of value financially back into the university. I think that often isn't the case, which um, I think should force us all to think about um, why that is and, and if we're not getting everything that we think we might like to be getting from this system, are there ways that we can fix it? Because I think that there's understandably a lot of frustration um, for folks who feel like um, products of government funded inventions aren't as available as they should be, um, and that this this could be a sticking point there. So if we're not getting as much bang for a buck as we can like, and there are some unintended consequences, there's some problems coming out of it, how could it work better? I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and then in terms of the degree to which university licensing aligns with the public interest, this is a speculation, but I think it's, uh, you know, the traditional lawyer answer of it depends and it probably varies tech transfer office to tech transfer office, tech transfer professional to tech transfer professional. Um, and I think if there are ways that we could um, maybe reduce some of that variability would be the way to put it and make sure that the public sector investments are going towards um, the public interest. Obviously, we want to make sure that products get commercialized and patents are often a tool that helps facilitate 
that. Um, so we need, in some cases at least, some protection around products that are coming out of the universities, but getting that balance right and making sure that um, we're consistently thinking about it's not just driving towards the bottom line, it's driving towards the best outcome, which is the product on the market in a way that it can do good, um, would be helpful. But um, that's just, again, speculation. I assume it varies person to person, office to office. Yeah, and so just to, just to follow on to that, um, our next um, Patents in the Public Interest conversation um, will be with a couple of folks who work on um, patents and access to medicines. I think that they've spent um, some time looking at uh, the role of check transfer offices and the Bayh-Dole Act and all of these things. Um, so you know, let's uh, so stay tuned. Um, I think we'll have a lot of really interesting conversations about that topic because it's, just, it's the the whole um, issue of university tech transfer and patents is a really really interesting area. Uh, so getting back to kind of talking about talking about your career. Um, so I know like everybody asks, you know, what's a typical day like in the life of um, in the life of Abby Reeves. But um, that's impossible because we, we don't have typical, day, typical days. Um, but are there particular like examples of things that you worked on that you think kind of highlight what it's like to be um, in this patent public interest space, like projects that you worked on or um, interesting meetings you've had, something like that? Uh, interesting meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had some interesting uh, encounters, uh, which I, I don't think are emblematic, but uh, basically had Hill staff yell at me for trying to connect them with their constituents, which I think is a very odd uh, situation. So there are like some odd challenges to doing this work. I would assume everybody wants to talk to their boss's constituents, but that's not always the case. Um, but in terms of, um, I think the most maybe fun part of my job is getting to talk to the startups and yeah, hear about the exciting work that folks are doing. One of the things that we do, um, I, can't, I can't remember if I mentioned this yet or not, but we set up meetings so that startups can talk directly to lawmakers or to uh, policy staff. So again, I got yelled at once for trying to do that. But those meetings are so fun because um, we bring in startups and they're there to talk about, uh, we did some conversations recently around Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which we consider very, very important to a vibrant startup ecosystem. And bringing in startups who host user-generated content, they're doing so many very exciting things. I love to hear about that, but I also love to watch the way that Hill staff engage with those individuals. Um, so there's a gentleman at our network who um, had a motocross accident and he is paralyzed, um, I think from the waist down now. And he started a uh, platform where people can leave reviews about the accessibility of different public spaces that they go, private spaces, restaurants, gas stations, um, just to provide information to other people in the community that have similar disabilities, what it's like to get around and how accessible it is to go into these spaces. It's an extraordinarily valuable service. Um, he has gone about it in such a thoughtful way. And so having him be able to share his story with Hill staff was very rewarding for me personally and being able to be in those conversations. And I think it's also this really important story that as people are like very annoyed at Mark Zuckerberg, uh, which I'm not here to take a position on that, but if you start taking away Section 230 because you're angry at Facebook, you're angry at something Google did, uh, making sure that you can also see these individuals who are doing really interesting, innovative, and important work through the startups in their communities um, and the impact that these policy changes would have on them is a really important part of the work that we do. And also, I think those conversations are just fun to be a part of. Yeah, and you know, I think that you know, just being able to put faces to some of the policy issues that um, you know often can seem very abstract. It just it, it, it's such an exciting opportunity, um, and you know, it seems like that 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 would be a that would be a real a real highlight. Um, I know that you've done the, these sorts of um, flying and startups to, um, to to Congress events a couple of times, and yeah, they they've all been really great. Um, you know, we've got a couple of academics in the in the audience um, who you know I'm sure have lots and lots of great ideas for how to reform the patent system or how to bring about other laws. Um, what would be your thoughts on like how to how to turn those ideas into action? Because that's something that you obviously have spent a lot of time doing. Like, what are the the sort of avenues that you take advantage of in, in those respects? And like, how, how how can organizations like Engine be helpful in that respect? So, yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, one other little piece of advice for any students, I think, uh, who are still in school is to get to know your professors. I think that having those relationships is very valuable in terms of enriching your time at 
school and making you more successful as a student, but also can definitely pay dividends for years after you graduate, if not uh, decades. So uh, I would encourage students to foster those relationships now while it's easy and you have the opportunity. And then also when you get out there in the world, it's a little bit easier to pay attention to the academic work that they're writing because, you know, these are people in your community, in your network that you're, you're um, talking to, you're seeing what they're posting on LinkedIn. So that's one little uh, tidbit of advice for the students. Um, in terms of getting ideas to impact, um, one thing that I like to think we would see more of, and hopefully we'll continue to see more of this, is around pilot programs and taking some of these ideas that come out of the research and the, the thought leadership and the thinking about how can the patent system work better? Are there ways that we can pilot these? And I know the PTO has done some pilots in the past, I think to, to mixed impact in the long term. But if there are ways that, um, for example, there was a, a pilot program proposed in the Unleashing the American Innovators Act, which I think is an idea that came out, um, from Professor uh, Latif Matima at Howard about giving patent applicants more information about the, the viability of their patent application early on. And it's similar to a, a program or an idea that Professor Colleen Chen at Santa Clara suggested about giving patent applicants a lot more information about the relevant prior art uh, before they invest a lot of time in their patent application. That's the sort of thing that we could try out as a pilot, see if it works, see if it helps improve outcomes, see if it helps um, people navigate the patent system more easily and see if it improves patent quality on the back end. And so finding ways to pilot these ideas is something that is very attractive to me. Uh, we do some of it. I don't think we do enough of it. I'd like to see us do more of it, but um, uh, sometimes my boss says we can't boil the ocean and this feels like one way to go about um, testing the water on policy ideas um, without making huge overwhelming changes all at once. They could have unintended consequences. They might not work as we intend. So it's a way to like kind of test the waters experiment, if you will. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a really interesting idea, and you know I hope that um, we we start seeing more of these um, these pilot programs. They've they've been really useful information <coughs> um, for for some of the programs that the PTO has done already. Um, so you know I think we're we're pretty close to our time. Um, so first of all, I wanted to just thank um, Abby for this fantastic conversation. You know I learned a lot about you know just kind of the work that you're doing, and hopefully the rest of the folks um, have have learned have, have learned a bit as well. Um, our next session will not be on Wednesday, it will be on um, Thursday, um, October 7th, I believe. And we will have, uh, where I think the schedule might be changing a bit, but we'll have uh, Zane Rizvi from Public Citizen um, talking about some of his work on patents and um, access to medicines and pharmaceuticals, which um, you know is a huge area, and I think will be a really interesting topic. Um, so hope that um, all of you can 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 join for for that as well. I think it'll be a it'll be a great conversation. Um, but unless there are any other questions, um, I'd like to thank Abby for a, for a great conversation and thank all of you for um, for joining today. Yeah, thanks thanks Charles and to the whole team at American. It was a, great to be here. All right, thanks everybody.